Hey viewers, Fernando from SkyFi Audio. Today I'm gonna to feature a Pioneer PD93 Elite CD player. This is an absolute gem, and you've gotta get a look at the inside. It is absolutely amazing. Um, this is about our sixth video in our um, series, uh, if you find one of these, buy, 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 in which I look for little gems that uh, sit in a very long lineup of players and CDs and amps and preamps from Pioneer, Sony, Yamaha, etc. Back in the 80s and 90s, they made a couple of real special pieces, but the trick is that they look very similar to its crappier siblings, and that is what I'm doing in this series, is I'm helping you identify the gems among them all. Um, and you wouldn't know by just looking at them. You've got to look inside, you've got to look at the engineering, the part selection, the quality to really understand. So in this video, I'm going to dive into this PD93. I'm going to look at the inside, the outside, the back, underneath, the controls, the remote, all of it. I'm going to show you what makes this piece so special. And then I'm going to compare it to its earlier sibling, the PD91. And if you stated until the end of the video, I'm going to put this in its stack. I have a full stack from this series. I'm going to show you what it looks like as a complete system. So hang in there. It's going to be about 30 minute video. I keep saying they're going to be 20 minutes, but they're not. They end up being 30. Sorry about that, but it's definitely worth it. So hang in there and thank you for watching. The first thing I do when I identify a cool piece is I go to the vintageknob.org. It's a wonderful website. These guys really, really did a nice job with it. And if I find it in there, it's a great endorsement that I found something special. And sure enough, they've got a real nice page on it. Manufactured in 1990, about. Uh, the PD-93 existed in the European and uh, Japanese markets as the PD-5000. And that's not uncommon for Japanese brands to do special stuff for the US market. And I believe they even did the display is slightly different. Uh, if you can make this out here, this display is an amber color while on the European Jap and Japanese versions, this would have stayed uh, its natural fluorescent color, which is about a green, something like that. And I'll go back to that a bit later. So it's a 20 bit uh, single disc player um, built to the absolute highest standards. I can't imagine them making a lot of money on this. Uh, CD player and uh, for one thing is I couldn't find what the MSRP is on this piece so if you do know it please leave it in the comments below I'd love to know what this cost back in 1990 and uh, we'll do a conversion and see what it would have cost by today's standards so this was a, a pioneer piece meant to compete with the Sony and the Yamaha I've done a video on the Sony X777 ES and the 707 uh, go ahead through the playlist if you want to see uh, more about it it's a great competitor uh, they're very similar in build quality, construction, and uniqueness, and uh, also uh, a great piece. So the PV93 was the top of the line at the time, and there's a great post here on Audio Karma. The gentleman took the time of outlining for us what the different models were. So he ranked, and this is a matter of opinion as well, uh, the 93 is the top dog in terms of build quality and Sonics. The PD95, which is a stable platter piece, uh, just below it and then you go to the 91, 71, 65, etc. So this sits is considered to be if not the best, uh, you know, one of the best. Only to be maybe uh, outshined by the PD95, but I've got an opinion on that as well and I'll share to you. I'll share why once we take a look inside. I am um, I'd like the PD93 much better. Now if we go to Hi-Fi Shark, which is a great place to um, get an understanding of what market rates are for pieces, we see that the PD-93, um, there's not a lot of them. It's going to be a tough find, but there are some out there. I see um, some listed on Audiomart, on eBay, etc. You're going to be paying top dollar for these pieces. Um, they are, I'm going to guess, for a good clean sample, going to go you know, $1,500 to $2,500 uh, for sure. Now let's have a look at the outside and sorry about the glare on the unit. It's a high gloss finish, uh, so it's really hard to photograph properly. It picks up just about every reflection. Uh, the first thing you notice, it comes in its traditional Pioneer Elite sort of colors, right? This called, they call this a shiny Irushi finish. Um, and that is the, the rosewood that we see here, which is uh, pretty nice. But unfortunately, it's still just a particle board piece. Uh, it's always disappointing, which means it chips easy and it damages and scratches fairly easy. I wish on the higher end pieces had gone to a hardwood, but I understand that this would have been some serious cost involved. 
in that. Um, but it would have been a nice touch. So we've got the, the rosewood with a really cool gold inlay right here and the high gloss finish on it. This is a very clean example. You're not likely to find something this clean out there. Uh, we're lucky to have had this from a uh, collector. Um, functionality is very, very simple. Um, it's about as few controls as you will find on any CD player. So we've got a, a mechanical power button. It's not a standby power button, which I like. It really actually turns the unit off. And that is the Achilles heel of most modern CD players, is that they're always powered on. The power button actually just puts the unit on standby, and those power supplies age and fail over time. So I like to see a real, you know, true power button on units. Display is very simple. <coughs> Excuse me. It has uh, just track and time on it. Uh, it's got a large drawer in the front, and this is pretty neat. It's got an output selector here, and this allows you to essentially turn on and off the digital and the analog section. So you toggle through digital on, digital and analog on, and just analog, and it quiets down some of the circuitry. So this is a really nice feature. I've never seen that in a CD player before, other than very deep in some menus of some esoteric units. Um, the ability to turn off the display, this is nice. It helps you sort of save the display over time. And also, if you like to listen in a dark room, it's a nice feature. And then the pause button, and the rest is standard play. Fast forward, rewind, stop, and open close. Now, with the open close, the first thing that's notable is it kind of slows down when it gets to the end of its travel. I assume that's some sort of soft open feature, or maybe an aging mechanism. But I'd love to know uh, from you guys what you think. If you have a piece like this, is this typical for this unit, or is this um, motor that's aging but it does seem like a some sort of soft open feature um, hard uh, solid aluminum top uh, which is nice to see it's anodized uh, aluminum and in the back we've got very simple stuff just a set of uh, RCA line outputs and this is the only disappointing thing about this player no balanced outputs um, it looks like a replaceable module here so maybe they meant at some point to go to balanced that's a real bummer. That's the only real advantage over the uh, PD95 has over the PD93 is that it does have balanced outputs. Not a big deal if you don't have a long distance to your preamp. It's just fine using single-ended, but I love balanced connections. So. Um, and then digital outputs. We've got a coax and an optical, not much else. Nothing else to be found here except for the transformers. We'll talk about that a bit. Uh, model designation is a 93, and you can see here it's made in Japan made in Tokyo, Japan, which is pretty cool. Um, let's talk about these power supplies, which is a bit crazy. Um, Pioneer decided to pop these in the back uh, for a couple of reasons. One is to have more space on the interior, and the other is to isolate them for the rest of the circuitry, which is pretty cool. But they took it a step further, because I've seen this before. I think I saw Yamaha had, had this, and a couple of amplifiers, vintage amplifiers. They took it a step further. They've actually mounted both transformers to an aluminum plate, and and isolated mechanically from the rest of the chassis through these sort of rubber grommets. That's really far to go on this. So they even have these tags on here that you should remove the securing transport screws uh, prior to operation to let the power supply sort of free float and, and be mechanically isolated rather than electronically isolated. So kudos to, Yama, uh, to Pioneer for going the extra mile on this and to come up with some new cool feature. Uh, the other thing that's noticeable is a massive power cord for a CD player. It is, in fact, a 16-gauge. Um, you typically see a, an 18-gauge at this point, but this is a power cord worthy of an amplifier. And it is captive, another bummer about this unit. Here we see that it's manufactured in June of 1990. And that's about it for the outside. Let me, uh, let me pop the top off, and let's, uh, let's get a look at the the real sweetness of this CD player. So opening these units is really nice and simple. They've got um, machine screws at the top with retaining washers in place. And then in the back they've got simple also machine screws uh, for them here. This is a nice touch. They've actually gone uh, copper screws for the, or at least copper plating on the, all the screws except for the ones that are on the top, which are black. Uh, 
there go all the washers. Here you see they've got some sort of uh, damping material here, uh, which situates above the laser mechanism. And, uh, but an eighth inch extruded aluminum top, which is really nice. No sheet metal to be found here. All right, now look at this craziness. Well, it's obviously all copper, copper everywhere. That's the theme here. They went as far as they could possibly go with the uh, application of copper. They've even wrapped each of the capacitors and not just the power supply capacitors, but just about every capacitor on this unit is wrapped in some sort of copper foil. Full commitment to copper here. Very cool, the chassis as well. Um, it sits on a honeycomb structure, which I think we'll see from below. And even the feet themselves, uh, I understand, are, are honeycomb. Let me look at that as well, Let's see if I can get this sideways. And sure enough, we see the honeycomb pattern, which provides some structural integrity. And, and the, uh, the feet themselves, even though they're plastic molded, they, have a, they follow through with the honeycomb theme. Very cool. And the power supply section has its own little foot here. Not quite sure if this is supposed to be sitting on the table, which would eliminate its isolation, or what it is. Let's see if we can see that in the manual. Go ahead and set it back. Now it's a super heavy unit. It probably weighs around 35, 40 pounds. Um, it would weigh more if it was made out of steel. But let me uh, give you some highlights as to what they've done here on the inside. So it's a pretty traditional layout in terms of components, with the exception of the power transformers on the outside. And um, they've designated one for digital circuitry and one for analog circuitry. It's not quite true. Um, sure, this one powers the logic board for the drive and the power supply, but this one labeled analog actually powers the digital to analog converters, so it's not ex strictly analog. Um, but I understand their intent. They've sort of dedicated this transformer to uh, the audio section and the other one for everything else, including the display. So nice job with that. You can see they've wrapped um, the leads in some sort of foil. This is the only time they didn't go copper. Um, so the analog uh, transformer leads go here through the front and land at the, um, and the two analog boards here. Uh, and the digital transformer powers um, the main transformer for the unit, which controls all the logic, transport, display functions, etc. Beautifully designed uh, glass epoxy boards, super high quality components throughout. And they even give us a couple of little test buttons here, which is unusual. Not quite sure what they're for, but I'll have to dig into that. A copper screws throughout, and really nice uh, layout. Um, another thing notable is that the control, the logic control board for the drive, is made by them. It is, in fact, a Pioneer uh, board, which is, uh, which is really nice. I guess they made their own complete units, unlike some of the manufacturers that went to a third party for the drives. Uh, Pioneer did their own, and it's labeled uh, PWM1285. So this is what controls the drive, and the drive itself is where things get really interesting. Um, the first thing to note is these copper uh, foil covered motors. There are two motors in place and Vintage Knob makes a reference to a gold-plated motor which I have not found in our unit but I understand that this particular unit they featured here was a pre-production unit so maybe they did away with the gold plating and ended up with copper. I can't really tell. It looks like a regular can motor with just copper on it and the other motor which is down there for the drawer um, does not look to be gold plated either. Laser is very interesting um, and unusual where the slide that contains the laser sits uh, in a horizontal plane stationary. It obviously moves uh, forward and back to scan the disc, but it sits still unlike other transports where the laser comes up to meet the CD. In this particular mechanism, 
quite the opposite happens, and it's through this cam mechanism here, this clamping mechanism, which is controlled by this motor here. Uh, essentially, um, cams and pushes down on the CD, and then mounts the CD onto the laser, which is stationary, which is really neat. Let's see if you can see that happening here. So here's a close-up of the, the clamping mechanism. Really unique. And then I think you can make out just over here how the, here's the laser tray, which is uh, obviously in a ma linear magnetic actuator. And then when I close the disc drawer, you can see the disc come down and meet the laser. Really, really cool. Um, the other notable thing, which I absolutely lost, love as a technician, is that they did not use any rubber belts for the drawer or the clamping system. You can make out here, just barely. You can make out that the, the motor is just below there with a small pinion to a large pinion, so it's a geared setup. And then they went to a cable actuated uh, for the drawer itself. So rubber belts are the Achilles heel of all CD players and my absolute nemesis. So I love seeing uh, CD players that don't use any rubber belts. That means that they're going to likely last a lifetime. Uh, rubber belts are good for about 10 years or so. And even this motor right here for the clamping mechanism, you can see it's got a warm tooth gear on it. And uh, going right to a uh, conventional gear. And so kudos to Pioneer. And that's why this player, the PD-93, gets my vote over the 95. I noticed online, I saw a picture of the 95. It's beautiful on the outside and it's very similar build quality, um, but it uses rubber belts. Uh, so that's a real bummer. And the transformers are packed on the inside of the 95. And it uses the inverted um, stable powder, which is a neat technology that Pioneer, uh, Pioneer pioneered which is um, starting with the 95, is that the disc would be inserted upside down and the laser would sit above the unit itself. So it would almost sit like a, on a heavy turntable platter. So they made a very thick drawer. Uh, the disc would go upside down onto a thick platter. And then as it would go in, the laser would sit above and, um, and scan the disc. Um, so they did that for two or three different models, which is kind of neat. Um, And uh, the other thing I mentioned earlier is that the PD-95 does use balanced output, which is kind of cool. So, but everything else, I love the 93 uh, above it. Although, in full disclosure, I haven't had a 95 in the shop, so. All right, moving on. Um, these are the analog, uh, digital to analog boards. We've got separate power supplies for left to right channels. It's real dual mono design, as you can see the line down here splits left and right channels. So this would be the uh, power supplies for this would be the left, this would be the right channel. Um, and, uh, you know, the digital signal probably comes in somewhere right about here, goes through the DAC, which is a, a dual balance 20 bit DAC, uh, which is a real nice, uh, nice architecture. I'm a fan of, of the sound quality of the 20 bit used here. I can't see exactly what chip they used because it's enclosed in some sort of cover, so you can't really service or see it but really high quality components throughout the DDA stage. And uh, they even have uh, a little cop copper separators uh, in here, as well as some copper buses. Look at this copper bus and the power supply. That's kind of cool. That probably carries the ground plane throughout. Very high quality capacitors. I can't make out the brand, but I suspect these are Nichicons because uh, of the color combination. Uh, nothing to see on the display side, and we can't really see what's below here, which would be the DAC, um, the facilities for the for the digital outputs. Not the DAC. The DAC's up here. Uh, down below would be another board um, handling the digital outputs for both coax and optical. Under this cover is just the, the splicing points for the AC. I imagine you can figure the voltage under this cover. 
Um, looking at the remote, this is probably not the remote for this unit, but um, it does go with our entire Pioneer system. And look at this craziness. I think I counted about 70 buttons on this uh, learning remote from Pioneer. This has the facilities to control this CD player as well as the tuner, preamp, etc. Thought I'd show you this craziness. You don't really see <laughs> something this overwhelming nowadays in consumer electronics. So I mentioned the PD91, which is its um, younger sibling. Uh, here I've got one that we've gone through already. A smaller cabinet, not as quite as good of a build quality, and uh, but I do like the display. I love these sort of early displays from the 80s that show you uh, all the tracks that are available. Um, quite, presents quite a bit more information. I love uh, direct track access. So. From an ergonomical point of view, I like the 91 better, but the build quality just quite, isn't quite there. Um, if you want to see a video on this one, I'm happy to do it. Please leave a comment below requesting it, and I'll jump in and, and do the exact same thing I just did with the 93 for this 91. You can see they used some of the same, you know, some of the same technology. They have isolated the power supply, but if you notice, they're sharing one for both digital and analog stages. Um, it's got a sheet metal top instead of aluminum. So quite a step down, but still a really, really nice player. So let me know if you, you want to see this in a future video. I also promised at the end I would show you the rest of the system that we've got here. Let's go over to bay one. Okay, I paused long enough to bring the CD player over here so you could see the entire stack in all of its glory. Top to bottom, PD-93, F-93 below it, the C-91 preamp, and then below that is the M-91 amplifier. So stay tuned for a video on this system as well. I'm going to link below to the Sony competitor I mentioned uh, before, so you can watch that video if you're interested. And I think that concludes this particular video. Thanks for watching. This is SkyFi Audio. Our website is skyfiaudio.com. Check out this craziness. We got about 600 pieces of equipment in stock uh, in our shop here at skyfiaudio.com. Please like and subscribe. It really helps keep these videos uh, going for you. Uh, I appreciate your support and your time. And uh, please leave comments below of anything that you want to share with us. Thanks for watching.